Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Mel Herbert here. It's time for MRAP TV. I'm on my two back in the house. I'm on my two talking about a couple of blocks. I'm going to tell you up front. It's a bit of a Morbitz thing, but which Morbitz thing? Go, Amal. Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the EKG case for the week of June 17th, 2012. And today, I've got a couple of cases that were contributed by Dr. Han Siong Yap. And I sure as heck hope I'm pronouncing that name properly. Uh, but uh, this is a, a very nice physician in Malaysia who's been a regular watcher or listener of these video cases. And he's uh, sent me some very nice cases over the past few months. And I wanted to share with you a couple of cases that he recently sent me. And these are uh, to be considered probably bread and butter, but nevertheless very, very important cases that we can work through. Just two cases. So I don't think this will be too long of a segment, but very, very nice and important cases. So this first case, and I don't have patient information to relate to you. That's okay. We'll work through this uh, EKG interpretation. So obviously, one of the things that's jumping out at you is that this is a wide complex rhythm, and you appreciate that there's probably some P waves that are not being conducted. We'll just take this one step at a time. So first of all, let's talk about the rate and the rhythm on this 12 lead EKG. We've talked about this before. How do you know that the atrial beats are coming? There's the atrial beats. How do you know that they're coming from the sinus node? Well, what you want to know is that they're upright in leads 1, 2, 3, and F, and generally they should be inverted in AVR. And so that tells you that this is a sinus rhythm. If you take a close look at those atrial rate, atrial beats, they're going at a rate of probably about 90 or so, so we can call this a sinus rhythm. And you also notice that there's two P waves for every one QRS, two P waves for every one QRS, and so on, and that pattern repeats. And so since you have P waves that are not being conducted, it implies that this must be some type of AV block. Now we're not worried about first degree AV block. The real question is, is this second degree AV block type one? Second-degree AV block type 2, also known as Mobus 1 or Mobus 2, or is this third-degree AV block? And if this were third-degree AV block, then one thing that you would expect is that everywhere there's a PR segment, it should be changing fairly randomly. And you clearly see that the PR segments here are not changing randomly. So right off the bat, we can eliminate third degree AV block. So that means that this must be second degree AV block with two to one conduction. Now, sometimes people look at second degree AV block with two to one conduction and say, well, is this Mobitz 1 or Mobitz 2? As you recall, if somebody has Mobitz 1, the PR segments gradually increase and then you get a drop. And if it's Mobitz 2, the PR segments stay the same and you get a drop. But the problem is that when you've got second gravy block with only two to one conduction, two P waves for every one QRS complex, you really don't have a chance to see whether the PR segments would be increasing and then dropping a QRS or staying the same with the dropped QRS. So the well, the purists generally would say that if you have a second degree AV block with two to one conduction, rather than specifying it as a Mobitz 1 or Mobitz 2, you simply call it a second degree AV block with 2 to 1 conduction. So the purists would say that this is nothing more than simply a second degree AV block with 2 to 1 conduction. Don't bother trying to call it a Mobitz 1. Don't bother trying to call it a Mobitz 2. Just simply call it second degree AV block with 2 to 1 conduction. All right, so the rhythm is sinus rhythm, Secondary AV block with two to one conduction. A couple other things that you also happen to notice is that these P waves are kind of bizarre morphology. They are double peaked, or some people might refer to that as a bifid or bifid. I don't know how to pronounce that word, but but a double peak P wave, and it's also kind of a wide P wave, and the bifid or bifid P wave, which is wide in lead two, that implies that there's left atrial enlargement, and usually that's associated with mitral stenosis. So left atrial enlargement, 
with mitral stenosis is present, probable mitral stenosis, I should say. There's also a right bundle branch block pattern, and there's also, you'll notice that there's a bit of a rightward axis in lead one, and that's because the patient has these Q waves in lead one and also in AVL. And remember, leads one and AVL are representative of the high lateral part of the left ventricle, and so that means that this patient has had a previous high lateral wall myocardial infarction. It doesn't look like there's any ongoing ST elevation or ST depression in those leads, so we presume that this is an old high lateral myocardial infarction with Q waves present out there. Interestingly, in V5 and V6, the other lateral leads, there is no evidence of, uh, of Q waves. So we, we might just say that this is a high lateral old myocardial infarction rather than saying that it's just a general lateral myocardial infarction. All right, so the formal interpretation here, once we put everything together, sinus rhythm with second degree AV block and two to one conduction, there's that left atrial enlargement and probable mitral stenosis, left ventricular hypertrophy. I didn't mention that before, but there's fairly large QRS complexes and when you add the S wave in lead two with the R wave in V5, it's certainly greater than 35 millimeters. And so there's LVH, the right bundle branch block, and the prior high lateral myocardial infarction. So there's a lot of different things on this 12 lead EKG that I think become relatively simple once you break it down. And in this particular case, what I really wanted to focus your attention on was the... Uh, the underlying rhythm here, that second degree AV block with two to one conduction. And also I thought that those P waves were uh, fairly interesting. All right, so let's go to the second case that he sent me. And this is perhaps a little bit more straightforward, but once again, you take a look at the rhythm. The P waves are upright in one, two, three, and F and inverted in AVR, that means that this is sinus in origin. And if you map out those P waves, they're going at a rate right about 100 beats per minute. So we'll call this sinus tachycardia. So we'll start with sinus tachycardia. You'll also notice that once again, there are P waves that are not being conducted. So that takes us back into the AV block box. And when you've got P waves that are not being conducted, you ask yourself, is this second degree AV block type 1 or Mobitz 1 or Wenckebach? Is this second degree AV block type 2, also known as Mobitz 2? Or is this third degree AV block? How do you tell the difference between those? Once again, you simply look at the PR intervals. And if you take a look at the PR intervals everywhere where there is a PR interval, you take a look at that PR, and then take a look at that PR, and take a look at that PR, take a look at that PR, and so on. And you notice that the PR intervals are randomly changing. And that means that this is a third degree heart block. There's no clear cut association between what the atrium is doing and what the ventricle is doing. And this is probably, since it's narrow, this is just a, a junctional type of escape rhythm. So, sinus tachycardia with complete heart block and a junctional escape rhythm. And then there's something else going on here in this 12 lead EKG. There's some ST abnormalities, right? There's ST elevation in the inferior leads, so that implies that there's an inferior wall STEMI. There's probably some reciprocal changes out here in the lateral leads, out here in the lateral leads. 1 AVL, V5, V6. And you also have to notice that there's some ST depression in leads V1, V2, V3, and the R waves in V, maybe a bit in V1, but V2, the R wave is just about as big as the S wave. That's a little bit abnormal. That means that the R wave is a little bit taller than we expect. And with ST depression in these anteroceptal leads and tall R waves in the anteroceptal leads, right? especially in the presence of an inferior wall STEMI, that implies that there's probably posterior extension of this inferior myocardial infarction. So putting all of these things together, we've got sinus tachycardia with complete heart block, 
There's a junctional escape rhythm. I didn't put that in there. I should probably put that in there. Junk, junctional escape rhythm. And then there's an acute inferior posterior myocardial infarction. Now, if any of this is unclear, the AV block, the escape rhythms, the presence of how you diagnose the posterior myocardial infarction, I've got good news for you. Actually, we've reviewed every one of these components of this diagnosis and also most of the components of the last EKG in previous video casts over the past few months. So just go back and review some of those older video casts and you'll nail the diagnosis here. But this is a nice opportunity this week of putting together a lot of things that we've talked about. Brady dysrhythmias, how do you tell the difference between a Mobus 1 and Mobus 2 and third degree? How do you diagnose a posterior wall infarction? How do you know where the escape rhythm's coming from? How do you know whether you're dealing with a sinus rhythm versus an ectopic rhythm? We've talked about all of these di different things on individual podcasts or video casts over the past several months. And so we've now been able to put all of these things together and make some very nice diagnoses. So hopefully you picked up on these diagnoses. But again, if any of this was unclear, please email me. I love to get emails with questions. Please email me or simply go back and review some of the previous video casts. And hopefully all of this will become very, very clear. But that's how we put it all together. And when you break it down into simple components, I think it does actually become relatively simple. Keep practicing those EKGs. I hope that was helpful, and I'll talk to you again next week. Bye for now.